Welcome everyone to today's Tumor Microenvironment mini webinar series session one. As you have heard, my name is Benjamin and I'm working in the R&D department and have the pleasure to give you a brief introduction into the super interesting topic of the tumor microenvironment. Um, I will try to give you a high level overview where I will present you some of the important aspects of the tumor microenvironment. So, as you are well aware of the fact that the body is organized in, on different levels, so like from the organ level to the cellular level, uh, we are today more interested in focusing on the cellular level actually, as uh, cancer cells or cancer arises from mutations which are accumulating in, in healthy cells and eventually transforming them into, let's say, uh, cells which are um, proliferating without any growth control and kind of generate a cell mass. And this cell mass eventually is not only composed of tumor cells, but it's also of other healthy, original healthy cell types which are infiltrating this tumor mass. And as you maybe <laughs> also have seen in this animation, it's not like something is there at the very beginning, but it is developing over time. And um, it is a very heterogeneous collection of immune cells, stromal cells and tumor cells. And uh, I mean, the first thing what one is interesting is to figure out like what parts are actually, which cell types are actually in the tumor microenvironment and which options do we have to, to look at, let's say, the phenotypes of cells. Um, I mean, one easy 1D approach would be to dissociate the tumor tissue into a single cell suspension and phenotype, phenotype the cells which are within that particular tissue one dissociated. Um, certainly, if one is interested in only certain uh, parts or certain cell types, one can either isolate them and cultivate them, differentiate them and perform downstream assay as, assays as one is interested. However, I mean, the general bulk tumor consists of, uh, yeah, as already mentioned, immune cells, tumor cells and stromal cells. Here's just some, some exemplary uh, representation of main subtypes for the different different classes. And um, so for immune cells, for example, NK, NK T cells, T cells, B cells, dendritic cells, macrophages, and then on the other hand, the stromal cells like fibroblast, endothelial cells, pericytes, and so on. And um, there's certainly some interaction going on. So they're just not sitting there and doing nothing. There's an interaction between tumor cells and immune cells, tumor cells, stromal cells, but also in between the, uh, let's say, healthy cells, there is some interaction and um, some modulation of it of the of the functional states of the different uh, cell types so as we want to start off with the immune cells um, i would like like i mean as you know also that the tumor microenvironment actually is a relatively plastic um, plastic compartment, let's say. Um, so there are two ends of the extreme, of course. There can be, let's say, the anti-tumor microenvironment, which is rather um, a hurdle which needs to be overcome by a tumor to initiate growth and continue to growth. Um, however, it's also, let's say, uh, in terms of prognosis for a patient, rather beneficial, of course, um, if the host immune uh, system is actually fighting or trying to fight the tumor. And some characteristic of such an anti-tumor microenvironment is, for example, the presence of uh, CD8 positive T cells or M1 like macrophages. And uh, the other end of the scale, let's say, is certainly an immune suppressive microenvironment so that we have immunomodulatory effects of tumor and stromal cells which are causing kind of the, uh, let's say, recruitment of cells, which are more or less hindering an effective immune response against the, the, the developing tumor, which can be then rather characterized by the presence of regulatory T cells and M2-like uh, macrophages. And um, 
certainly these advances of TME understanding have enabled um, the development of really effective therapies, as you are well aware of immune checkpoint inhibitors, for example. Um, one important thing is, as you also um, maybe have heard of, or as I mentioned already, that it is, or it's also here in the title <laughs> and on the bottom, that it's super heterogeneous collection of immune stromal and tumor cells. And it's not only heterogeneous in between, uh, let's say, different uh, tumor entities, but it's also in uh, heterogeneous in between patients having the same tumor or even within the tumor that there are different compartments which are uh, let's say having a different fun different functional state. Um, just an example it's, uh, to, to show you how heterogeneous tumors can be. Uh, it's shown here in this heat map um, where they have compared at least on a relative scale the number, let's say the frequency of certain immune cell types in different uh, tumor entities. And you can see there's really large or broad scale, like from lung adenocarcinoma, which is highly infiltrated, at least on average, in comparison to the other side of the scale, like gliomas, where you do not find that many immune cells. Um, interestingly, um, one thing one can think of um, that mutations, which are actually accumulating in tumor cells, do actually have a direct um, impact on the composition and function of immune cells. Because, I mean, on the one hand, mutations can generate new antigens, which might be um, detected by lymphocytes and also cause lymphocyte infiltration, like CD8 uh, positive T cells, for example, which is actually then also again good for the patient as the um, immune system is trying to fight at least uh, parts of the cancer cells or cancer. And on the other hand, certainly there can be also mutations which induce a rather immunosuppressive microenvironment, so kind of shape immune infiltration so that there is, for example, the mutation of the um, wind signaling better cutting in pathway, which is kind of limiting again then the accumulation of cytotoxic T cells, for example, or infiltration of cytotoxic T cells in the tumor, which is of, which is of course, as I've shown on the previous slide, not the desired state, at least for the patient. And uh, on this on a third a third option actually is also that I mean mutations can cause um, alterations of immune functions once immune cells have actually entered the tumor. So, I mean, if immune cells are in the tumor and uh, tumor cells, for example, express PDA1, that kind of can also thereby mute or suppress uh, immune activation. And um, exactly. So, as mentioned, then here on the bottom, the mutations influence the nature and function of the immune cell composition. And this is now just actually looking at the um, one dimensional scale. Um, interestingly, in the last decade or even longer, also the topography actually came into play. So not only looking at the composition of and, and the functional state of certain cells, cell types, but also where they are actually located within a tumor. So you can cut your tumor into sections, image them, and also, of course, perform phenotyping so that you know which cell types you actually are looking at and also identify where they are and which relationship are they actually to, to each other. And another uh, point, of course, which imaging enables you to look at is the extracellular matrix, which is definitely not possible if you're just dissociating um, uh, your tumor at least not to that uh, extent. Uh, also, he, also here I have some examples. Um, actually, this is in line with what I've shown you before. Um, there's a study by Carter et al. who did a direct comparison of uh, the immune cell topography across various cancer entities. So there are some definitions of how um, tumors can be classified with respect with respect to their immune cell topography. So it's hot, cold or excluded. If there are many um, 
um, immune cells within the tumor, it's called hot. If there's a lower frequency, it's cold. And if they are only found at the margin, it's the excluded type. And as you can see on the on the on the lower graph here, there's not really a correlation or um, in between different tumor types. So it's looking very different. So it's also high heterogeneity uh, just for these two markers, which I've uh, selected here to show uh, in between these 12 or 10, actually 10 different tumor types. Um, for example, if you are looking at the lung adenocarcinoma, you have one third actually, which is showing the excluded uh, type. And then if you are looking at the CD3 positive lymphocytes, however, then for macrophages, for example, you do not find these excluded uh, type of uh, topography. And uh, the functional state somehow, of course, has also an impact on the uh, treatment and progression, depending on which and how many uh, cell types uh, you are finding in the in the tumor microenvironment. Um, they actually also took a um, closer look at colorectal cancer patients and uh, more extensively characterized these, uh, this cohort. And there they were also showing that there is a high difference in the shares actually of hot, cold and excluded topographies. I mean, as you have seen already for the two markers or two cell types, which I've shown you on the previous slide, also here then for the six um, phenotypes they have characterized, you see that there is in most of the cases no real correlation. I mean, the correlation you will see here. Um, so it's not said that in case you have a CD8 hot environment, that it is necessarily be also a FOXP3 uh, hot tumor. And uh, the same is true also for other for other markers. And interestingly, what they also identified is that there's not a single marker which is prognostic, but only a combination, um, actually a combination of CD8 positive and CD163, so macrophages. Uh, this was the only way how they could stratify uh, patients and could an idea of which patient group has a better uh, prognosis in comparison to the others. Um, actually, taking this analysis and interpretation of spatial information to the next level is a study which was done by Schirsch et al. Um, they were not only analyzing the frequencies and locations, but developed a model on how cellular neighborhoods are actually communicating with each other. So they were using um, um, uh, a multiplex imaging approach so that they really could characterize, I think, 27 um, cellular phenotypes on these sections and assign then, of course, the phenotype to a particular region. So that's just the segmentation you can see here on the lower bottom. They actually use two colorectal cancer uh, patient groups where it is known that they have a clear difference in, in survival. So it's like the CLR type, it's a Crohn's-like uh, reaction, and the DII, which is diffused inflammatory infiltration. And as you can see here on the right graph, um, the CLR type tumors actually have a much better prognosis compared to the DII ones. And they were interested in identifying um, yeah, what is actually on the cellular level or on the cellular neighborhood level, let's say, different in these two tumor types or versions of one type. Um, so after determining the phenotype of the different um, cells, they went on and, um, and identified, let's say, nine neighborhoods. These neighborhoods are actually uh, nothing else than one particular window of, of the section. And they were looking which cell types do we actually find in this particular area. And certainly it's not only one particular cell type which you find in a larger area, but uh, yeah, but a number of different cell types. So these are all the cell types they were looking at. And as you can see here, these nine neighborhoods are 
mainly or mostly composed um, of, of many different cell types. Certainly there are some, for example, the bulk tumor, which is mainly then consisting of tumor cells and only little other cell types. But for example, the T-cell enriched uh, areas or neighborhoods, there you do see that there's a composition of many, many different cell types. Um, next to these neighborhoods, actually, where they could identify clear difference with this follicle neighborhood, which is a tertiary lymph tertiary lymphoid structure, which is actually, let's say, the main effect why the prognosis for these CLR types, uh, CLR, the colorectal cancer patients, is much better. So here you do have some uh, interaction of uh, and activation of uh, immune cells, which you do not find in these DII uh, patients. So that's why actually in the later analysis, as you can also see here, they excluded this particular uh, neighborhood because they were interested in, uh, interested in other differences. If they could identify more differences than this follicle uh, neighborhood. And uh, they were actually able to identify differences. So they had um, for the DII patients, they identified cluster one, which is T cell enriched and, and cluster four macrophage enriched. They identified a close interaction of these two neighborhoods. And also within these neighborhoods, they saw that, for example, here the regulatory, they also looked at the functional state of certain cell types. So, and here it's about the regulatory T cells, the proliferating regulatory T cells, which are found in these neighborhood four, which are higher, let's say, in these DII patients in comparison to, to, to the CLR type. Um, so overall, actually, they were coming up with a with the model, which was then showing that, of course, there was this interaction of T cell enriched neighborhoods with macrophage enriched neighborhoods. And within these macrophage enriched neighborhoods, actually, they identified these upregulation or presence of um, activated or functional uh, proliferating regulatory T cells, which are just kind of Im giving Im immunomodulatory stimulus to the to the environment by just suppressing any reaction here. Um, but interestingly, what they also identified within these DII patients actually is that um, they could see some prognostic value or let's say survival improvements in case there were PD1 positive, CD4 positive T cells in granul granulocyte enriched neighborhoods. Mm. So overall, um, these DII patients just showed a really impaired anti-tumor response due to some immunomodulatory, immunomodulatory function, which is ascribed to this T cell macrophage, um, uh, close T cell macrophage uh, interaction. And uh, I mean, overall, what what's the reason I'm showing this 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 uh, example is actually that the spatial information here can actually yield to uh, yeah can yield clinical biomarkers. So that really deep analysis of spatial information is able to reveal some uh, markers which are prognostic for particular patient cohort or can be prognostic for a particular patient cohort. Um, of course, what I've shown so far is only on the 2D level. So everything you see is just uh, on one plane and you're kind of blind for everything which is above and below. And ultimately, the um, there might be some selection bias because you're only taking a few sections and uh, the tumor is super heterogeneous and it's not necessarily representing the, let's say, the, the real state of all compartments of the tumor. Uh, there, of course, the 3D analysis would be superior. Um, I mean, I don't have now any specific example for that, but just a picture from one of my colleagues' uh, uh, papers, which is uh, published or out soon, where we just see 
the vasculature and actually also the presence of uh, T cells like CD3 positive cells. And you also can appreciate here the heterogeneity of on the one hand the vasculature and on the other hand also the present and presence and distribution of T cells. And if you would just take one cross section, eventually you would not get the full picture. Um, so advancing towards 3D microscopy would be, of course, um, beneficial to get a better overview or better impression on the spatial information, the full spatial information of the of the section one is uh, looking at. Um, coming back to one of the previous slides I've shown you, um, I would like to very briefly dive into the stromal cell types and how they impact the TME. It's really only one slide as it's a very short presentation here today. Um, I mean, the recruit also the recruited stromal cells kind of can promote tumor progression or kind of are uh, interacting with the developing tumor. So for example, once the tumor uh, grows and uh, exceeds a certain size, there will be some angiogenic factors which are, uh, let's say, recruiting endothelial cells to form a vascular network to um, to bring in nutrients and remove metabolic waste products. However, um, maybe I guess you know that also that the vasculature itself of tumors is rather aberrant and dysfunctional. So it's not said that it is a nice vascular network which is properly supplying all parts of the tumor as it would be probably the case in, in healthy tissue. And in hand goes let's say the pericyte coverage, which are normally there to stabilize and keep the lumen open of blood vessels. Um, in tumors, it's often the case that it's only a loose coverage of pericytes, so it's not very <clears throat> dense as it is in healthy, it can be in healthy tissue, and um, thereby kind of having a rather leaky vasculature often with, uh, in tumors. And as a third component, then of course also fibroblasts, where a lot of research is going on, or cancer-associated fibroblasts actually then at some point, uh, which are responsible then also, for, or which can also exert some immunomodulatory function, I mean either direct by secreting growth factor cytokines or ECM components, which kind of uh, shape the physical uh, properties of the of the microenvironment of the tissue itself. And also then, as mentioned, the extracellular matrix components, which are eventually secreted by fibroblast. Um, if they are like either there or absent, they can be, let's say, also a physical barrier of substances to, to, to diffuse or to propagate within the tumor tissue. But um, also in case they are broken down, can just release certain growth factors or cytokines again, which are promoting or evoking any other downstream processes then. Um, all right, so just coming back to one of the initial slides and just a teaser, let's say, to, to provoke some thinking is actually this slide for, because uh, when I was researching a little bit for this presentation, I came also, of course, across the microbiome. And um, it's, I think, another aspect which uh, which makes it even more complex to think about the tumor microenvironment or immune system and in general, as it is known. And there has been a lot of research on the microbiome and how it inf uh, in, in impacts the immune system, that it certainly to some extent has or can have also an impact on the tumor microenvironment, right? Um, just to keep that in mind, that it might be another layer, of adding an, another layer of complexity to the whole system. So not only looking at the cells, but also at the microbiome and the interplay of, of both. So already at the summary then, um, I was trying to kind of find the right bullet points for the summary and um, regardless of what I was trying, so heterogeneity was always very prominent. I mean, you have seen it on several of the previous slides and uh, also here it is at least two times 
And um, if you are now going from top to bottom, so it's a heterogeneous collection of immune stromal and tumor cells. If you are just looking in the one dimensional way, just at the phenotyping, taking the second and third dimension in here as well. So heterogeneous cell topography. Um, and then also in 4D, let's say, if you think about it over time, it is also heterogeneous. So it's not one static uh, situation here, but it's rather uh, dynamically changing. Um, however, certainly it's super important to 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 investigate the tumor and vi microenvironment, even though it's so complex, because it is uh, really it has been shown that it has implications for patient uh, stratification and prognosis, and also to identify. Uh, let's say new treatment uh, targets, so which is making it worth, let's say, to making it worth all the efforts to unravel the TME and the interaction within the TME. This last slide, I would just briefly dive into the topic of what we can offer for the analysis of the tumor microenvironment, and it's actually. Um, more or less presented in the upcoming talk, uh, talks today and also in the upcoming weeks. Um, so overall, we are trying to um, offer solutions for the whole workflow, like starting with the transport solution from the very beginning after taking out, let's say, tissue from, from, from the patient, transporting it to the lab, storing or freezing it, dissociating the tissue for phenotyping or any cultivation, sorting um, or differentiation assay, whatever one is interested. Also clean up in case one is maybe interested in sequencing and has specific requirements for these um, experiments, but also then clearing reagents, which enable you to, to, to image your tissues in 3D as we will see later in the talks today. And with that, actually, I'm done. I'm at the end of my presentation.